So I want to go ahead and bring him up here. I'm very excited. So I have the distinct privilege of welcoming Christopher Skip McCall. Thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you this evening. I've been looking forward to this since Emily first contacted me. And uh, I, I think we're gonna have a, a nice time tonight. I'm going to share some information with you uh, concerning uh, my experience here in Statesville. Uh, and I feel that uh, I, I have so much to share I could probably talk for the rest of tonight. <laughs> I really do. The challenge I always have is how do I cut this back? But certainly, we know that history is so important to us. Those who do not learn from their history are subject to redeem it. And certainly, there are some things in history that I don't want to repeat. So, uh, I'm not going to do a whole lot of uh, prelude, all right, because we've got a lot to cover in this short time that we have, all right. So, uh, first of all, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the fact that this is Black History Month. Now, it's the shortest month of the year. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything because it's not about the quality of time. It's all about the quality of time. And hopefully tonight uh, we're going to make our time uh, with quality. All right? So thank all of you for coming out and sharing with me uh, this evening. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this and now it's here. So let's get started. Uh, certainly, Black History Month, even though it's a short month, actually, black history is American history, all right? And uh, it's not just for a month, but black history is 365 days, all right? So uh, we're going to move on uh, at this time with the next slide, please, Emily. Now, any time that I speak about or do training or any time I'm engaged in the subject matter that we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, I have to get you to buy in. Uh, and there's a personal agreement that I ask you to sign. Now, you don't have to sign anything, <laughs> but uh, if you would, internalize this in your mind and in your heart, all right? Growing up while I'm black, personal agreement. And I would like for each of you to read through this with me and then make a personal commitment to what we're going to do here this evening. I, whatever your name is, understand that it is okay to be imperfect with regard to my understanding of people who are different from me. I have permission to reveal ignorance and misunderstanding I have permission to struggle with these issues and to be open and honest about my feelings. I am a product of my culture, upbringing, environment, education, and experiences. And I am who I am. I do not have to feel guilty about what I believe, but I do take responsibility for accepting as much new information and knowledge as I can and challenging myself to examine my assumptions and beliefs, granting permission to the other members of the group to struggle with these issues and to be open and honest about their feelings, agreeing to respect the confidentiality of all the personal information shared in, in this group. So please, uh, would you <coughs> sign that in your mind? And really, this is just sort of a guideline as to, as to how we're going to behave and act as we go through this session this evening. All right? Any questions about this? Okay. Next slide. 
I'm going to talk to you a little, uh, little bit, and it is just a little bit, considering, considering as much information I have to share. But we're going to keep it tight, and we'll get through this. I won't keep you here all night long. Growing up all black in Statesville and Idea County. That's going to be the topic for this evening. And uh, certainly me as your presenter. I was born in a little black, as a little black boy, born in 1951 in a house located at 1017 Lorraine Court in South Statesville. Both of my parents are black. All of my siblings are black. I was raised in a black community. I went to an all-black school through the 11th grade. My DNA is 99.9 etc. percent the same as all other human beings. I am a member of one race, and that is the human race. I'm going to talk about my first experience with discrimination. And that occurred when I was uh, seven, eight years old as a young boy in state school. And uh, my grandmother used to take me or bring me, really, uptown state school. And we would ride a bus up here. And many people do not know, do not realize that Statesville at one time had bus transportation. Uh, I lived in what is called now South Statesville, but at the time that I was growing up in that community, it was referred to as Rabbit Town. <laughs> and Rabbit Town was just a fun, enjoyable place. My grandmother and I would walk up to what we call a hard surface street. Uh, and that was Monroe Street, which ran east and west. And we would have to walk from our home, which was deeper in, in the uh, Rabbit Town community, until we got to the hard surface, and that's where we caught the bus. However, when we would get on the bus, they had a glass container that you would drop your money in, pay your fare. And that could have, it only cost one nickel. And so me and my grandmother would get on the bus. And um, as we got on the bus, we would drop our money in this glass container at the front of the bus. And as a young boy, that was exciting to me, especially coming from Rabbit Town. Because Rabbit Town in South States was pretty much my world. And it was so exciting that I really wanted to sit up front to watch that money fall down in the glass container. And so I would want to stay up at the front of the bus and sit and watch that money fall in the glass container. However, my grandmother would grab me by my collar in the back. And she'd say, come on here, boy. Come on back here with me. And back there with her was at the back of the bus. And as I sit in the back of the bus, I watch little white kids up front playing and having a great time, which is what I wanted to do. And I couldn't help but think is that, OK, why can they sit up front and stand up front and have fun just watching that money fall in, in the job. Why come I can do it? And certainly as a seven year, year old, uh, it was hard for me to explain or articulate that. But I realized that something is different about me. And it was years later that I realized that that was my first experience of discrimination in station. My grandmother was, she called herself, or we called her, Mom Bessie. And Mom Bessie just loved me. She loved me more than any other 
Ciao, Frank. Ciao. She did. I mean, she taught me everything. I did. She even taught me how to cook when I was seven, eight years old. And she loved me. And so when, uh, whenever she uh, went uptown and she went shopping, uptown stays for uh, once or twice a month. And she would take me with her. And I would be so, so happy. Uh, she taught me how to shop uptown and how to stay out of trouble. Because realizing at that time, I was only, let's see, seven, I was only eight years old. And so there's a lot of things that I really didn't know. And she taught me a lot. She even taught me the do's and don'ts as a young black child. And so I would have such a good time with Mom Beth. I attended an all-black school, which was Morningside. And those of you that are familiar with it know that Morningside was wonderful. It was. It was an all-black school, and that was when uh, the school system was actually uh, a segregated school. We had everybody at this school were black people, black teachers, black principals, black administrators. Everybody was black, but it was a fun place. Tell you, we had some of the loving, caring, uh, supportive teachers that you want to find anywhere. I mean, they did. We enjoyed going to school every day. Uh, I played, uh, played football. I was the quarterback on the football team, uh, on the basketball team. Uh, I had a lot going on, just like some other students. There was a lot going on, and we, we really enjoyed going to Morningside School. Uh, <clears throat> the environment was one, or the culture itself was one that uh, we could relate to. Uh, we would uh, have dances and uh, plays and things, and as a matter of fact, I got one of my, my, my ride or die buddy here who was amazing. And I want to just want to recognize him right now, uh, Mr. Arnold Feimster. And this boy was a natural actor. I'm telling you, he was Denzel Washington before Denzel Washington. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. The boy was good. I'm telling you, um, it's good to see you, man. All right. Uh, so it was. Uh, uh, going to school at Morningside was very, very interesting. Uh, it was a learning experience, and we had great teachers that looked after us. Uh, certainly, they were loving, caring, but they were also strict. <laughs> I'm telling you, that that's when they still had uh, had punishment in school. So if you got out of line, those teachers would know how to get you back in line. And uh, we had close interaction with our teachers simply because we would see them at church. Uh, many of them live right in the same community that we lived in. And so we engaged with them and saw them and talked to them a lot. And I tell you, that was something that uh, was very, very meaningful to us. A lot of fun and stimulation at Morningside School. We loved Morningside. Next slide, man. Ah. Then came the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, Civil Rights Movement was uh, very interesting. And certainly it was about the rights of people in our community. And, uh, and that's why I like to share this quote from Alexander Hamilton says, the rights of mankind must not be rummaged for in old parchment or musty record, for they are written 
as with the hand of divinity itself in the whole volume of human nature and cannot be erased or obscured by mortal hand. <coughs> wow, that's powerful. But certainly, when I first got a taste of uh, studying civil rights in high school and uh, certainly with things that were going on in the community, uh, I never will forget that there were marches uh, that I participated in, along with a lot of other people, uh, even while I was still at Morningside. And there was one march, I never will forget it, uh, that was called from the mountaintop to the valley march. And that was led by, um, by Dr. Uh, Golden Finch from Asheville. And that march is, the march's route was from Asheville all the way to Raleigh. And it so happened that the march came through Statesville. And man, I tell you, we were all in school, in the classroom, and nobody told us that that march was coming right down Garfield Street, right past Morningside School. And we were sitting in class, and we heard the march coming down the street. And I'm gonna tell you, something got a hold of us. <laughs> it, it did, it really did. And it moved us. And I was in the, what was it, ninth or 10th grade at that time. But anyway, when that march came through, um, something just hit me and a lot of other students. And next thing we knew, we were up out of those chairs and headed out the door. And the teachers was hollering and calling us and saying, hey, hey, come back here, y'all can't go. We didn't pay them any attention, I'm sure. We didn't pay them any attention. And most of the kids at school left their seats, left their classroom, and joined the march on down Garfield Street, then made the right turn down Salisbury Road, and the next school we came to was Unity. And when we got to Unity, the same result. All those kids poured out of that school, and we all were marching. And you know what? We actually marched all the way from Statesville to Salisbury. Wow. I'm serious. In the struggle and to advocate for our civil rights. And when we got to Salisbury, well, the leaders of that march, Dr. Finch and the other leaders, told us, hey, look, because <laughs> we was going to, we would have went all the way to Rock if they had allowed us. <laughs> I mean, that's just how fired up we were. <clears throat> but they told us, hey, look, you kids got to go back. <laughs> Y'all don't have teachers' permission, you don't have the principal's position, and you certainly don't have your uh, parents' position. Uh, uh, permission to be out here on this walk. So they lo loaded us up on uh, church buses <laughs> and brought us back to Statesville. So that was a very interesting uh, uh, event. What that year was that? Do you remember what year? It was, uh, let's see, I remember it was in my 10th grade. It was uh, 1960. 67, 66, 67 school year. Yeah, she was. And uh, we marched. But even after that, uh, you know, most of us got in fever for marching and protesting. Uh, and uh, we participated in another march, uh, which was actually a sit in. Uh, we had a sit in actually right here on the corner at the end of the street, right there on the corner. Uh, that was, Woolworths was there. And certainly during that time, you know, Woolworths, um, we could go into Woolworths and get a sandwich, but we couldn't sit down and eat it. We had to take it outside and eat the sandwich. 
And uh, we would get the sandwich and have to walk down to a place called Post Office Lunch. Anybody remember that? Okay. And uh, we go down and sit behind Post Office Lunch on L Crate and eat our sandwich. Uh, and that was uh, that was kind of kind of tough. Uh, one other thing is that when I came down to town with Mom Bessie. Um, she would uh, always tell me, you know, to watch myself, and watch what I do, and make sure that I obey her and listen to her. So when I would get thirsty, I would tell my Bessie, yeah, "Mom Bessie, I'm thirsty. I, I want to drink water." And so she had trained me uh, on what to do to get a drink of water. And actually, uh, there was a water fountain right up here behind the courthouse. Mm -hmm. And I would go down there and uh, she would tell me, now when you go down there to get a drink of water, she would stay in, I think it was Redison, she would stay in the store and continue to shop while I would get a drink of water. But I knew the rules. So I would come down, grab a drink of water, and then I would hurry back up to the store to catch her. But you know, curiosity got the best of me. <laughs> I, was, I was a curious little boy. And I did some things that I probably shouldn't have done, but it just was something very interesting. So one day, I told Mom Bear, I said, I'm thirsty. I need some water. She said, well, you know what? Go get it. You know, go and come straight back here. And so I came down Center Street and turn right there and come down this street to the back of the courthouse where the water fountains were. And as I walked up to the water fountain, I started to run. I'm like, why does Mom Bessie not want me to drink? I have no other fountain but the colored fountain. I said, something must be wrong with that water coming out of the white fountain. <laughs> but again, curiosity really got to me. And by the time I got to that water fountain, I looked around <laughs> to make sure wasn't nobody looking at me. And I got to that water fountain and I just sneaked a sip of that water. <laughs> I did. And to my amazement, that water would taste it the same. <laughs> I'm like, my goodness, what's going on here? And then I started examining the pipes and stuff to see, you know, what's going on with this water. And I looked at the pipe coming up out of the ground, and then there was two pipes that branched off of that one pipe to the two fountains, the color and the white. And I looked at it, and I'm like, my goodness, it's the same water. <laughs> I mean, it was like nothing I had never seen. It surprised me. And I went back and I told Mom Bessie what happened. And she said, well, I've been knowing that. She said, I just didn't want to tell you. She said, I know you will find out sooner or later. And I said, yes, I did. But that was interesting. Uh, we had uh, Playhouse Theater, right? Down the corner, then down uh, uh, East Broad Street. Okay. Now, certainly, uh, we would walk. We would walk all the way from Rabbit Town to get to the movie theater. And uh, once we got there, whereas all the white patrons could walk in the front door and go in and sit in cushioned seats. And that was nice. Uh, air conditioning, that was nice. However, as blacks, we would uh, get to the playhouse, but we didn't go in the, we couldn't go in the front door. Uh, we actually turned and went down the alley and up the fire escape. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'd go in the movie and sit down in the balcony. There again, it was segregated. Pretty much everything was segregated at that time. 
Uh, and, you know, we got so used to it and accustomed to it, hey, it really didn't matter still, until we started to come to the realization that mm, something's not right, something's not fair about this. And we made it, made it through that. Civil rights, we had uh, some civil rights people in the city that were brave, uh, that was uh, fighting for rights, uh, and who really, uh, I mean, they did some things that I certainly probably wouldn't have done, but it was amazing the change that they brought. As a matter of fact, uh, we had one, one man uh, who we called him Stacefield's own Dr. King. And his name was uh, Reverend Wilson Lee. And Wilson Lee was amazing. Uh, he had a lot of heart and he wasn't scared of anything. And he really got to make some changes in this community. We also had another pastor, Pastor Reverend J.C. Harris, uh, who uh, fought the battles and uh, brought uh, to this community a lot of changes. And the thing is that uh, most of us are living uh, on the changes that uh, those people were able to make for us and open up doors of opportunity all across this community and this county. Okay. Oh, court order desegregation. As I said, I went to an a all-black school all the way from the first grade through the 11th grade. And I loved Morningside because, you know, <laughs> that's what you do. You, you go to school all your life to get to your senior year <laughs> because seniors get privileges and they get to do things that the other students don't. And you really look forward to that. And like I said, I was quarterback on the football team and Bassett point guard on the basketball team and uh, made pretty good grades. As a matter of fact, at that time, a straight A in school. Uh, I had it going on. <laughs> and I was looking forward to the senior year. I couldn't <laughs> wait until, senior, until summer was over and we'd start back to school. <laughs> However, there had been a lot of talk about integration and desegregation going on. Uh, in Statesville. And when we got out uh, uh, for the summer uh, after my junior year, we pretty much felt like, well, they didn't do it since school, before school got out, they probably ain't gonna do it now. And so we felt kind of relieved. <laughs> However, the courts made a decision and an announcement during the summer of 1968. Good gracious. <laughs> and when I heard that announcement, the first thing that caught, come to my mind was that, my God, how are we going to go from, how are we going to make that transition from a tiger to a greyhound? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, that was the first thing that brought to my mind. <laughs> because Morningside was the golden Tiger, the Golden Tigers is bad. I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> they come out there on their football field, they'd be strutting their stuff. And so I'm wondering, my goodness, how are we going to make that transition? <laughs> but we had to make it. <laughs> we actually made the States for High School for our senior year. And that was tough. It really was. It was tough. As a matter of fact, some of our black children or black classmates decided they weren't going. They said, I can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. And they actually dropped out of school wow. before going back in that senior year. There was uh, many of us who lost school.
scholarship. Uh, and I know my, my, my ride or die brother, Arnold, this boy had all kind of opportunities to go to college to become an actor. And I know he could have succeeded, tell me, however he lost that opportunity. It was just uh, so much change uh, when they integrated or desegregated the school. Certainly, the first day of class at Statesville High School, uh, we entered the high school through the front door. And for the most part, certainly the administrators and the teachers uh, and even most of the students were uh, very respectful and receptive of us coming into their school. And things got off to a pretty decent start. As time went on, certainly some things happened. Uh, there were some uh, skirmishes, which I'll call them, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, some people, uh, people got into a little uh, fight here and there, uh, and it was kind of difficult. The main thing that we had a problem with was that um, at Morningside, the music that the band played, <laughs> Uh, the uniforms that the band wore and that the teams wore, uh, the chorus, uh, everything was related to us as a black culture. That's the way the school was. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really, really nice and we had fun. We enjoyed going to school because we had that kind of culture there, the music. Everything that was going on there at that school. However, when we got to Statesville High School, there was nothing in the culture that we could relate to. Uh, we did not have plays like we had at Morningside. <laughs> um, we did not have, and, and the Grenadier, Grenadier Band was, was bad. It was tough, but they didn't play our kind of music. Uh, uniforms, uh, you know, we just could not relate to it. And we had a difficult time uh, being in that environment. But certainly as time went on, uh, some things changed. Uh, even I had a close call at Statesville High School uh, and I was, uh, like I say, I was, I was a good student, but I was really I was upset and angry because I did not get to graduate from Morningside. Mm -hmm. And so one day, uh, some of us young men was in the auditorium and uh, a group of us was standing over at one door and uh, as we were standing over there just talking, it was during lunchtime, then a group of, uh, of white students boys came in the door on the other side of the auditorium and they lit us up with ice balls. And I was standing at the door and um, I saw this one kid throw an ice ball. And it was amazing because I saw that ice ball leave his hand. And I was standing there and watching that ice ball come directly at me. And the thing is that I became petrified and could not move. That ice ball hit me dead in the chest and almost knocked the breath out of me. And the white boy that threw it, he ran out the door over his, on his side of the auditorium. And so I ran out the side of the door on my, uh, out the door on the side of my, of the auditorium I was on. And my hope was that I would catch him <laughs> coming around the building. You know what? I did. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> and thank God for it, is that the principal <laughs> saw everything that happened. Ah, okay. 
And just as I reached for the boy that threw that ice ball at me, the principal, Mr. Albert Hyatt, walked up behind me and he grabbed me. And he says, don't do that. So, they believe he took me to, the, to his office, actually, and talked to me about what was going on. And that was a turning point uh, in my life at Statesville High School. Because what happened was that Mr. Howe was, um, first of all, he was, um, he was smart enough, but he was also attentive enough to really start to talk to me and my ride or die buddy <laughs> on. And I bet you, we sat down with Mr. Hyde at least, what, at least three times a week. I mean, when we would come to school in the morning, uh, the, the people at the desk, the, the assistants and the secretary at the desk, all they would do when we walked in the door, they were like, and basically was telling us, Mr. Hyde wants to see you. But we sit and talk with Mr. Hyde on several occasions about what we as black students were dealing with. Uh, we even talked about what white students and challenges that they were dealing with. We talked a lot. And one day, Mr. Hyde said, to, uh, he said, you know what? He said, we need to have a student assembly. And I told him, I said, well, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And uh, he said, okay. <clears throat> he said, but who's going to speak at it? <laughs> and I looked at him, and I told him, I said, well, you were the principal. <laughs> I said, you ought to speak to him, speak to him. And he looked at me, and he said, mm -hmm. He said, well, Skip, I, uh, I don't know what to say to the student body. So he said, I think you ought to speak. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, I think you ought to speak. I said, well, I don't know what to say. And he told me, he said, I tell you what, you tell the students what you and I have been telling me. And so I said, OK, I can do that. <laughs> and so he called the student assembly. We had the entire student body assembled in the Gray Auditorium. And uh, come time to speak, uh, I got up and spoke. And all I did was say what God laid on my heart to say. Well, I tell you what, after that speech, blacks and white <laughs> students started to hug each other, mm -hmm. crying. Uh, some apologizing mm. to each other. Uh, the whole auditorium was just in a tizzy. <laughs> it was an amazing sight that happened that day. And certainly, uh, after that day, things kind of settled down. And we went on to finish that year and graduate. Mm -hmm. It was really amazing. Um, one of the things that I, I learned about uh, the desegregation of Statesville High School and being a part of that is that one of the things that we at Morningside, we would receive uh, new books. However, when we looked into the new books, there was like four or five names already signed in. <laughs> and we would read those names because we knew the difference between the black name and the white name. <laughs> and those were white names in that book. And when I got to Statesville High School, uh, I'd say I was a pretty good student, but I struggled with uh, physics and trigonometry. Uh, and at that time, I realized that the books that we were receiving were hand-me-down, and I call it the hand-me-down education. Mm -hmm. And so we paid, we paid the price for that. But 
we still made it through. Let's go to the next slide. One thing about that turning point is that uh, it was decision-making time for me. If I was going to continue to be angry and mad uh, about what had happened to us, or was I going to be able to deal with it in a different way? And after the incident and us talking and interacting with Mr. Hyatt as the principal, I realized that there's some good that could come out of it. And we did. Uh, Mr. Hyatt uh, was amazing. He really was. As a matter of fact, even long after we graduated, uh, we had our 50th anniversary uh, class reunion. And uh, before that class reunion, I called Mr. Hyatt and I told him, I said, Mr. Hyatt, I need to, need to have breakfast with you and talk to you because uh, there's still some things that I'd like to know about what went on and how we dealt with things uh, during that senior year. And so we did. We met and had breakfast with the seven times and talked about that year and stuff. And, uh, and I told him, I said, well, one of the things I want to do, I want to thank you for actually saving me. <laughs> because had he not, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have made it through high school. And then Mr. Hyde says, well, I want to thank you and all the feasters for saving me. <laughs> I'm serious. That was the words he told me. Because y'all taught me some things about your culture, uh, about everything about you as black people. And as a result, like I say, I still see people today. I mean, it's been over 50, 50 years. And they bring up that speech. Uh, at the auditorium, uh, and they still remember it. So a lot of good has come out of it. And then I made a decision that I needed to go straight. That was my decision, is I need to go straight and do things to try to lead people and uh, certainly influence people to do the right thing. And I also learned, because the thing is that before I went to Stacey High School, I didn't know nothing about white people. I did not. Because we didn't interact with white people. Uh, Rabbit Town in the black community was our world. We didn't have cars. We didn't have ways to make transportation or would, uh, have transportation. I mean, we, we, we were pretty much confined to our community. But it did. It helped us to spread our wings and get to know and understand people who are different from us. I got, uh, got well, I didn't really get kicked off the football team, uh, but I quit. <laughs> I was up early in the season, and some things happened that I wasn't appreciative of. And uh, one day, me and several of other black kids uh, walked off the field and didn't play football that day. Also, uh, by, by the time basketball season came around, I kind of, you know, come to my senses <laughs> about some things. And so I did go out for basketball, and uh, actually, me, right there, and my other ride or die buddy, <laughs> Phil Robinson, who was the first two blacks to play Boston basketball. And then finally, next slide. Hmm. Um, through all the challenges and all that we went through during that senior year, uh, and it wasn't easy. Uh, however, at the end of our senior year, I, along with uh, Wanda Houghton, was selected as Mr. and Mrs. SHS. We had to overcome a lot to get there. Next slide. And then later on 
1992, I was actually elected to the Idaho State School Board, which is uh, certainly at that time uh, they had merged the school board, uh, and uh, we had uh, done a lot of things to try to get uh, get them ready uh, for that. Actually, there were four black girls who broke the ice of segregation at Statesville High School. That was in 1965. Uh, court ordered desegregation of Statesville City Schools in 68, 69. And actually, uh, we and uh, some other guys, like Mr. Wither Beatty and Reverend Charles Roman, um, actually, who were plaintiffs in the lawsuit, but, uh, brought a lawsuit against the city of Statesville for its election system simply because black people could not get elected under that kind of system. Uh, and we were able to change that. We actually uh, won that uh, lawsuit. And, uh, and then once we won it against the city of Statesville, uh, then uh, we went to the school board and we asked them, and they told us, don't, don't sue us. <laughs> just tell us what you want us to do. Which we did, and they did it. Uh, and then I was elected, uh, certainly, as a member of the IDL State School, school Board. <laughs> hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that I wrapped up at uh, the student uh, body uh, meeting is that, uh, and I don't know how I came up with this, but uh, at the end of it, uh, and I think that that's what brought the house down. Uh, <laughs> is that uh, I I had gloves in my pocket. I had a black glove and a white glove in my pocket. And nobody knew I had it in there until the end. And at the end, I pulled them out and put one on each hand. And then I told the students is that look, we're all in this together. And we're either going to swim together or we're going to sink together. Mm -hmm. and the best thing for us to do is to understand how coming together and unifying ourselves together can make a big difference for all of us. And doing that, none of us lose and we can all be winners. However, I didn't have gloves today, <laughs> but we do have hands. And the thing is that, you know, we need this a coming together and a unifying of people regardless of how you look, your religion, uh, where you live, regardless of your individual personality. And certainly we're all different, there's no doubt about it. But the fact is that we can live through the differences that we have among us. And the way things are now, and the division that exists in our community and our nation, we're in deep, deep trouble, y'all. We really are. And the only one that can save us is us. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you would take away from this tonight, if you don't take away anything else, that divided, we can't stand. And I do hope that you will take that with you every day, everywhere you go. Certainly, uh, after, after uh, graduating, Went off to college at uh, North Carolina Central and only stayed a semester because we didn't have no money. <laughs> and uh, when I didn't go back to school that second semester, I had to leave it and go to work. But within that month, I got my draft notice. And I got drafted. <laughs> and even at 19 years old, I uh, went into the Army, and uh, I went into the Army in April, and in August, I was in Vietnam. 
spent 10 months in Vietnam. And I'm telling you, it was not easy. But I learned a lot. And that was a great experience. So, you know, and, and the thing that I know is that, and probably some of you, is that what we fought for and what we put our lives on the line for is not what's happening in America today. Mm -hmm. It wasn't for that. And I hope that, as they say, we can wake up and smell the coffee mm -hmm. and understand what's happening to our country. And what's happening to our country is happening to us. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you will take that with you and never forget that. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, some clothes, uh, as black, we couldn't even put on. I mean, we could look at them, uh, but no, we could not uh, try them on simply because they, again, you know, people had their own uh, suspicions about things. And certainly, as black people, we didn't have those kind of privileges. And as I mentioned before, is that. Uh, we, we could, uh, as a matter of fact, Woolworths was about the only place in uh, the post office lunch that we could buy a sandwich at Woolworths and go down and sit in the back on uh, Elkhurst and eat the sandwich. And we could do that. But uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, opportunity uh, in uptown states. Uh, it was, uh, was, was kind of kind of tough. What happened to the teachers at uh, Morningside? Oh, that's a good question. Because we had a school full of black teachers. When we got to Statesville High School, I think we only had three black teachers. Huh. Uh, and many of them uh, left town. Uh, and certainly some of them got other jobs in other places. And that was one of the, one of the struggles that we had as students because at Morningside, if we had a problem or an issue or concern, then we could find, we could have a teacher, somebody that would talk with us and tell us what we needed to do. We had a support group. When we got to Statesville High School, we didn't have anybody. <laughs> I mean, really, it was real tough. I got two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, First, what, what happened to uh, the Statesville Buses system? Hmm, Statesville Buses. Well, uh, I'd say we had, uh, I think we had two buses that were uh, providing transportation to the community. But then, uh, uh, certainly, uh, the, the bus station of the bus, bus service was located right down here on Shelton Avenue. What was his name? I think. Uh, Moody White. Moody White. Moody White. White. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mary Uh And so, you know, just things happen. And then uh, certainly uh, after a while, uh, we got transportation for the black students out of South Statesville and other places. Uh, and it just, uh, through a process, uh, 
those buses wasn't needed as much because we didn't we didn't have school buses. I mean, we would <laughs> we would walk to school. And as a matter of fact, I remember me and uh, Phil Robson, who was the other kid that we played basketball together. Uh, on away games, we would parents would provide us transportation in their car. And sometimes we would get back from away games late at night. And some nights it would be raining, it would be snowing, <laughs> and it might be icing. Uh, that's just the way it was. And when we got back, uh, the parents that were driving would drop me and Philip off at the gym at Statesville High School. And sometimes uh, it would be pouring down rain. I mean, it would be rough. And we both, Philip lived right down the street, down on Garfield Street. However, I lived in Rabbit Town. And so when Philip turned off, I had to walk up Depot Hill, go across the railroad track tracks and fight them big rats <laughs> and, and to get home. So it was, uh, it was tough. Uh, What's your second question? Well, I mean, you know, in those days, um, you know, I did drive to come over a whole come lot of diversity and make a, a lot of progress to get us to the point, you know, I think the way it was everywhere to get us to the point where we're at here then. Mm -hmm. um, the progress that we've made as, as Indian people. Um, but here in recent years, it seems like we are kind of taking a turn for, you know, to kind of go on reverse. Do you have any suggestions on what we may could do as a community and as, as a people to, uh, to try to overcome that? that yeah. yeah. You know, Would you summarize the question because we can't hear that. Okay. okay. The, the question is that you know we have made we have made some real good progress up to this point, uh, and uh, it has it has been encouraging that you know as a community we've come a pretty good way, and even as a country and society that we've made some progress, considering certainly. From what we came, uh, we can we can feel different. However, it appears that even though we made a lot of progress forward, it seems like that uh, we're starting to take steps back with what's going on in our communities today. So that's the question that he was asking. Uh, I tell you what, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest one of the things that I I used to do is that. When uh, I, I went to work, uh, well, certainly after I got out of uh, high school, I went to college, and then I got drafted into the uh, Army, and I spent my time in the Army. I got out of uh, the Army, and, you know, thank God the blessing from that was that I was eligible now for the GI Bill, <laughs> and that was great, because it enabled me to go back to school. Uh, and do some other things. So that was, uh, that was really a blessing. Uh, the thing is that my advice is that, and I like to say, I've traveled, I actually went into my own business in about 15 years and traveled all over the country because after the experience going through state school, uh, high school, is that I realized that, uh, you know, racism is not something that's in your genetic. It's not something that we're born with. It's something that's taught to us. And so I decided that I was going to uh, make a difference by teaching other people that they could beat racism or being racist. And I did. I trained uh, people all over the country, really. Uh, so <clears throat> the thing is that my advice to you is that I'm going to take uh, a lesson from Mr. Hyatt, the principal, is that what made the difference was Mr. Hyatt was, had an open mind and an open heart. And he was willing to dialogue with us and listen to us. And it's amazing the difference that, that made. And that's the problem that among a lot of us is that we don't talk, we don't dialogue, uh, we don't even get to know each other, uh, and that sets us up for failure. 
And I know the effects that Mr. Hyatt had on Class of 69, it was really amazing. Had it not been for him, we would not have made it. So, you know, talk to each other. And even if you don't agree, that's okay. But talk, dialogue, you know, share with each other. And uh, like I say, we, we, we're, we're all different, but we are all similar in some way. We have to, we have to talk to each other in order to understand <coughs> each other. And understanding will take us a long way. All right? Okay. Okay. Yes? I'm just curious. Um, you were talking about the band music uh -huh. was so different from the school you came from. You got to stay so high, and, and it's just different music. And I've been trying to figure out how that might have been. What, what the band music you were listening to was. <coughs> Can you think of an example and how it was different from the, the white music that you heard at the high school? I'm, I'm thinking 1968. I'm thinking, okay, that might have been like the Four Tops or something. <laughs> 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 but there was a uh, at the White House. Not, not quite at the, uh, at the, at the school. Uh -huh. Now, we did have some, uh, some, some soul kind of music where I, uh, it was appealing to black students, uh, to black people, period. And so we get that. However, uh, we had a music director, Mr. Ripple, who could play any kind of music. And sometimes he would. He would drop something on us that we didn't know or hadn't heard. But it was, and it wasn't soul music, but the way he presented it was good listening music. So, a lot of times it, uh, it is, it's about who's doing the music and who understands uh, what it takes to uh, make the music appealing to the audience. And then, like myself, now, I mean, I grew up listening to, you know, James Brown and, <laughs> and that soul music, and I loved it. However, now I've broadened, you know, my appreciation for music. I even listen to some country music, all right, because I like it. John? I have a boost on what I kept saying. One of the great thrills growing up, especially, was when we had Christmas parades. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Morningside, that yeah. band would come, and they would light us up. And then the uh, Unity College in Salisbury. Yeah, Livingston. Listen, the drum major would put on the show himself. Oh, yeah. I mean, he had to knock the damn. Different cadence of the music. It was just very fire, very alive, and you became a part of it. Whereas the Lena States will uh, States was in your eye, the Three Deers, which was a great band, it was more steady. It was more classic, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And that's what uh, one of the things that I would tell people is that, you know, what we went through was not integration. Uh, really it wasn't desegregation. It was uh, assimilation, assimilation yeah. where we had to give up everything about us, our culture and everything, and assimilate into the white culture that existed. And I certainly don't, you know, I don't blame or point things. I just call it like I see it, and hopefully we can learn from it and do better. You don't think we would do that today, would you? Don't you think we would have learned that you know, when you want to bring another group in that you need to listen to them and do some of their music, have mm -hmm. some of their teachers. Mm -hmm. What did you all do on um, different uh, clubs and things like that? Yeah. But yeah. you're right. And they just, I wasn't there then. I was gone. Mm -hmm. But they, it just, you know, you're there. You, yeah. you count it as a number. Yeah. I remember when I started teaching, that I had to count every day how many blacks, how many whites, how many of other people were in our classroom. Every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What year yep. was that? Like that? 85? Well, that was, uh, that was uh, it's been years ago. But there was a lady that was being considered for, what is the Supreme Court? I think it was the Justice Department. A lady by the name of Lonnie Grenier. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And, and she got into trouble because she proposed that uh, <laughs> the schools, you know, would have a ballot of music for the prom. And basically she says, you know, if you've got 25% uh, black and 75% white students for the prom, she says then make the music. Make 25% of the music black and 75% white. And that's basically how she was trying to address that to ensure that, uh, you know, everybody got a little something, yeah. all right? And if you give everybody a little something according to, you know, their percentage, then they'll be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that didn't get very far. <laughs> As a matter of fact, she didn't get very far. <laughs> okay. Yes, Trish? Uh, my question is, you know, we with you saying we need to talk more, you know, have dialogues, is there anything going on around here that we can get involved in where we can have that dialogue and interact more and be able to talk and ask questions with, our, you know, different cultures and everything? Okay. So yeah. people, you know, because people are curious. Yes. Know. Yeah. And they, unfortunately, uh, we, we as a community, really don't have uh, something that really, I mean, we have programs and events and things at the Civic Center. And as a matter of fact, I attended the uh, Circle of Giving, uh, their uh, program uh, a few weeks ago over at the Civic Center. And I tell you, I was really impressed <laughs> because it was almost a balanced crowd of blacks, whites, mm -hmm. and certainly some Hispanics in that, uh, in that mm -hmm. uh, crowd. And I just looked around and I'm like, wow, this is, this is nice. Mm -hmm. However, we need to uh, do things that are uh, certainly, uh, that has an opportunity for us to really come together and really share with each other. I mean, and to be just like that uh, thing that I showed, uh, is that the problem is that uh, I've attended a lot of training and done a lot of training, but the problem is that we have a difficult time being open, honest, and truthful mm -hmm. with each other. We really do. And just like, you know, when Desmond Tutu, when Nelson Mandela got elected uh, as president of South Africa after 27 years, in a uh, political prison, uh, and he became president, uh, and he appointed Desmond Tutu to head up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And Nelson Mandela says that, you know, the first thing that he wanted them to do, he didn't want them to go out pointing fingers and blaming people and this and that and other. The first thing he wanted them to do was to find what is the truth about what happened during apartheid. Because Nelson Mandela says that until you deal with the truth, you're not gonna come up with the right and the best solution. And unfortunately, America has never really dealt with the truth. Mm -hmm. You're just have, yeah, we are, you're right. We are scared of the truth. And until we gain the courage to really deal with the truth, talk about the truth, be open and honest about the truth, uh, we as Americans are going to be limited in terms of how much progress we can make. Should we tell you? Yes? Sir, I was just wondering, in your training, how do you deal with social media? Because that seems to be our, mm -hmm. the big variable yeah. right now, and how things can go you know, like wildfire, rumors, and you, so, so attention, you pay attention yeah. just to the things that you want to hear. Yeah, social media needs regulation. And uh, I'm not one to regulate everything, but social media's gotten completely out of hand. It has. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a, a lot about money because uh, social media makes a lot of money, uh, but it causes a lot of damage. And the damage that it's causing is not worth the money that's being made off of social media. Mm -hmm. And as America, I don't know why we don't make that an issue come election time. And that's all I can say. It needs to be regulated 
because the people that own it really, in my opinion, don't really care about regulation or anything else. Making too much money. That's right. Making too much money. And from a, from a citizen standpoint, we need to also remember that we have control over it too. Yes. You can, you can stop using it. Exactly. You, can, you, have, you have the ultimate control in this. You can quit sharing the, the misinformation. You can, you can stop this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. From a psychology standpoint, it, the buck stops here. Yeah. That, that's, where, that's what you got to do. And that's what we have to keep in mind, that we have a government of people, by the people, and for the people. But we the people... Have, we have to take personal responsibility exactly. here, too. And we don't take personal responsibility, maybe on the election day, but after that, we turn that all over mm -hmm. to the Congress, to the Senate, mm -hmm. to the President, and uh, the things that they're doing is not going to take us where we need to go. Zuckerberg's making the buck, but you're the one that's clicking the buttons. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I think uh, <laughs> we've been, uh, we've timed it. I'm giving you.